Okay, so this is very important. This is a life safety piece of equipment. Will it save your life someday? Probably not. Could it? Maybe. So I would encourage you at least one time to read through the book. It could have some important information in there for you. What I'm covering today is just really just scratching the surface. So on lunch one day, you may have the multi-ray book or the manual brought up on screen and just skim through that. Again, it's a life safety piece of equipment. But I do want to teach you how to get into the menus now because you may be on, on duty when you're running a hazmat or responding to a call where there's volatile organic compounds. So all Ray Systems instruments are the same. To get into the menus, you're gonna push the power and the no button at the same time. So everybody go ahead and do that. Power and no at the same time. Hold them both down until the screen changes. And then way in the back, the fellow holding the meter that belongs to Mason Fire, did it go right into the menus or did it bring up a password screen? It did bring up a password, great. And everybody else got to the password screen? Okay, so this is a little confusing. The password is four zeros and why they gave you eight spots, I'm not sure. <laughs> but the first four spots aren't used. You wanna focus your attention on the four blanks that have an asterisk in them. You wanna move the cursor to the first asterisk, use the up arrow to make that a zero, then use the over arrow to move to the next position and then the up to make it a zero, over, up and over, up and over till you have four zeros set on screen, and then hit, uh, what's it say, enter? Done. Or done, yes. Then hit the button lined up with done, and that will bring you to this screen. These are your six main menus inside the multi-ray, and this is how you would navigate to make some different choices. I'm gonna quickly walk you through these. We won't spend a lot of time because I want to spend most of our time teaching you about correction factors, but I will talk about each menu really quickly individually. So the first menu is that calibration menu. So go ahead and say select to that, and when you select the calibration menu, you'll see all the sub-menus listed within the calibration menu. You can do things like a fresh air cow, a multi-bump, uh, a multi-span, uh, you can do a single sensor bump, a single sensor span. You can change the cow gas you're using. There's a lot of choices in this menu. And again, I wouldn't make any changes until you've read the book and fully understand it. I would just lean on your gas meter guru to make those types of changes. So go ahead and hit the back button to jump out to the next main menu. The next main menu is your measurement menu, but I'm gonna skip it and come back and make that one the last one we talk about because that's where I'll teach you correction factors. So go ahead and advance over to the alarms menu and hit select. And then you'll see all the sub menus within the alarms menu. And you can see you can change things like your low alarm, your high alarm, your stills, your time weighteds. But again, right now it's set everything to OSHA standard. So I would leave that as it is unless your standard operating procedure says, no, we're gonna change those alarm limits, okay? Hit your back button to jump out to the main menus again, and everybody select the data log menu. So the data log submenus have everything to do with your data logging. You can choose your data logging interval. You can choose which sensors are data logged. Uh, there's multiple choices in there, and they're all related to the data logging on your meter. So go ahead and hit your back button and hit uh, jump to the next main menu, and I wanna point something out here. Everybody see how you've got wireless menu as a choice? If your meter is not a wireless meter, it's gonna skip that menu and jump right over. But I'm fairly certain that the demos that I brought, and of course the meter that Mason Fire purchased, that is your wireless menu. So let's all go into the wireless menu if you have it. And in the menu here, you have all the sub-menus that you would expect with your wireless menu. And in here, you can change things like your PAN ID, your network ID, your user ID. There's several things in here that you can select. The thing I feel like you'll use most often is called join network. So when we get to the next phase of your equipment and you actually purchase what we call the EchoView host, if that's the way you're gonna go, you would wanna program in the PAN ID and the channel ID on this unit and you'd wanna make sure that it was matched on your multi-ray or any of your wireless gas detection meters. 
because that's the way they know how to link up. They need to be on the same pan ID and channel ID, and you can have eight instruments connected to one EchoView host, okay? And again, sometimes when you change a setting, you'll have to prompt the instrument to join the network. And so you'll use that submenu out of your wireless menu. All right, so everybody hit the back button and go to the last main menu, which is your monitor setup menu. It's got the universal icon for setup, the two little gears. And as you can see, this is where everything else is. So um, as you start scrolling down through that, you can change the user ID, you can change the site ID. This is where you'd change the date, the time. You can set the date and time format if you like. Um, the gentleman in the back, there's uh, one called Power On Zero. So if you'll scroll down to Power On Zero, select Power On Zero, and then drop down to the Enable button, and then you're about to turn on that fresh air calibration at the startup sequence. If you'll go ahead and save that change, the next time we turn your meter on, it will ask you for that fresh air calibration. That go okay? Perfect, good deal. All right, so any questions about the things that you can change in the monitor setup menu? All right, so everybody bounce out and navigate back to the second one that we skipped. It's called the measurement menu and go ahead and select that so you can go into the submenus of the measurement menu and then remind me what the first one is. Sensor on off. Sensor on off. Pretty self-explanatory. I could go in here and turn sensors on and off. I think you guys can handle five pieces of information simultaneously so I would always leave the sensors on. The one time you might want to use this menu, when an oxygen sensor fails, it fails to zero. And when an oxygen sensor is reading zero, obviously it's an alarm. And so it's somewhat annoying if it's beeping all the time. You could actually go in and turn off a bad oxygen sensor and be able to use the rest of the instrument. Uh, now, it could affect your LEL reading, so I, I wouldn't recommend that for long term because an LEL sensor does need a proper amount of oxygen to burn the sample. Uh, but if you know, if you're standing there breathing, you know that the oxygen content is good. It's just a way to eliminate an annoying sensor while you're waiting for that new sensor to come in before you install it. But again, I would leave all the sensors on. If you drop down one, what's the next menu say? Change measurement gas. That's the one we're going to play around with. The third one is uh, change... Uh, Change measurement units, yes, thank you very much. Your two choices are reading in part per million or reading in cubic meters. And I promise you, you'll never want to read in cubic meters. So this is a menu you'll probably never get into change. It's always going to re uh, remain on reading in units part per million. So go ahead and go to that change measurement gas menu, select that. And then you get uh, your choice of either the VOC sensor or the LEL sensor, because both of these sensors can have the correction factors changed. So really, I'll let you guys pick either one you want. Pick either the LEL or the VOC, because we're getting ready to run through a quick little classroom drill where I'm going to show you how to set correction factors. Once you've selected the sensor, go ahead and select it. You'll go to the next page. And then the very first selection on the next menu says what? My list. My list. What's cool about the My List is you can go in in advance, pick the gases that you think you'll deal with most often, and go ahead and drop them in the my list. Now you've got 10 correction factors that you can find real easily, real quickly. If you drop down one, what's the next one say? Last 10. Last 10. So that's saying, here's the last 10 correction factors that have been picked on this instrument. The next one is actually the gas library. That's the one that we'll enter. And then the last one is a custom gas. I actually had a customer do this. It was a chemical manufacturer out of Nashville, and he had a chemical that they make that wasn't in the library. So he went to his chemist, he got the characteristics of that chemical. We went through the computer to reprogram his correction factor library, and then he was able to set a custom correction factor. It's really cool. First responders, mainly you're gonna be dealing with the things that are already preloaded, okay? So go into that gas library, and as soon as you go into the library, you're going to see a long list that you could scroll through. And if you stop on any of those gases, your screen will turn into an information page. 
Well, if that's not the gas that you wanted to choose, just hit the back button so you can get back to the library, and then you can go back to the list and scroll down through your choices. So I'm going to give everybody about 15 seconds to scroll through that menu, that list of correction factors, and just randomly go ahead and pick one of the gases in there. Let the mouse stay on that gas for a second so that the page changes to an information screen. And then I'll go around the room and we'll go through by example how a correction factor will work for you. Okay. So we'll start with you. First of all, which sensor did you select? LEL or VOC? LEL. Okay. And then which gas did you pick out of the LEL menu, the uh, library? Methyl bromide. Methyl bromide. Cool. So the very first line says methyl bromide. And then what's the next line say? Say chemical formula CH3BR. So CH3BR, that's just the chemical name of methyl bromide. And then what's the next line say? Molecular weight. Molecular weight. What's the molecular weight? 94.9. Of 94.9. .9. Where would the gas be? Low. It'd be low because it's heavier than air. And so it would be on the floor. So our, our multi-ray is helping us to decide where would that gas be located. So it'd be a heavy gas on the floor. And then what's the very last number on your screen say? CFLO or LEL. Mm -hmm. 2.4. 2.4 is the correction factor. So watch what happens there. If <laughs> Your correction fact, if, if you didn't have a correction factor applied and your LEL sensor got up to 10, it would reach that low level alarm. It'd start beeping at you to say, hey, I've reached 10% of the LEL. Remember the two little tick marks on the graph? But if we go in and we program in a correction factor, when I reach 10, the instrument's going to multiply the 10 by 2.4 because that's the relationship of methyl bromide to my cow gas, which is methane. And it takes the 10, multiplies it by 2.4, and now my reading will show 24% of LEL. So by applying that correction factor, I've already reached my second stage alarm, okay? So it corrects the reading for um, whatever gas you dial in on the correction factor library. So what did you choose? Acetate. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot. Is, did you choose the VOC or the? VOC and the gas? Ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate. And then um, what's the molecular weight listed? 88.1. 88.1. So again, another heavy gas that would be at our feet. And then what's your correction factor? 3.8. 3.8. So if I was going to read 100 part per million, but I've corrected it to ethyl acetate, the instrument's going to take 100 times 3.8, and I'm actually already at 380 part per million. Okay, what'd you choose? The LEL or the VOC? VOC. VOC, and what was the gas? Ethanol. Ethanol, and what's the molecular weight of ethanol? 46.1. 46.1, so again, a heavy gas that would be down at the floor. And then what's your correction factor? 4.74. 4.7. 12. 12.74, so that's a big correction factor. If I was gonna be at 100 part per million, but I've corrected it, it's going to multiply it by 12. Now I'm already at 1,200 part per million. Okay, Let's flip that. What if I was only going to read 10 part per million, but I apply the correction factor? Well, now I'm at 120 part per million instead. 10 times 12, 120. So you see how that can give you better readings. What did you guys choose? The LEL or the VOC? LEL. LEL. And the LEL correction factor you're applying for which gas? Turpentine. Turpentine. There's a good one. And what's the... Molecular weight? 136.2. Woo, the heaviest one so far. So definitely on the floor. And what's your uh, correction factor? 3.0. 3.0. So if I was going to be at 10% of LEL, it's going to multiply it by 3, and now I'm already at 30% of LEL. So you're going to get to that 100% LEL faster with turpentine than you would on straight methane. What would you guys choose? Uh, VOC. VOC channel. Uh, diesel fuel. Diesel fuel. There's a good one. Everyday occurrence. And then what's your molecular weight? 216. 216, so another very heavy gas. And what's your correction factor? Uh, 0.70. 0 0.70, so thank you for the other side of the example. So if I was going to read 100 part per million, but I'm correcting it to read diesel fuel, well now it's gonna take the 100 times 0.7, and I'm really only at 70 part per million. And that's just the relationship of the diesel fumes to our surrogate gas we use to calibrate, which is isobutylene. And then finally, what did you choose? We also chose diesel fuel. Also chose diesel fuel. Okay. 
So does everybody see how that example works for you and how that correction factor can give you a more precise reading? So the important thing to remember is when you're dealing with unknowns, you've rolled up on scene and you don't know what the VOC is or you don't know what the flammable gas is, you stay on the correction factor for your cal gas so you're getting a one-to-one -one reading. So what was the cal gas for your LAL sensor? Methane. Methane. And the cal gas for your PID sensor is isobutylene. So I didn't finish the thought. When you bring up that correction factor page, you get a choice at the bottom that says save it. And if you were to save, hit the button to save it, it's going to lock in that correction factor. At the end of your run, though, you'll want to get back into the menu and put the LEL back to methane and put your PID back to isobutylene. Does that make sense? Great. All right. So you can go ahead and start backing out of that menu. And then if you want to grab your Toxibray Pro that's on the table, we'll talk about this one real quick, and then I'll put you guys on break for the last segment. So go ahead and turn on your Toxiray Pro. I'll talk about it while it's warming up. It's the same type of user interface that we just went through with the Multiray, um, it, except it only has two buttons, okay? So it's got a power button and a yes plus button. So when you're trying to make a selection, you'll just cycle through the numbers till you get to the number that you want. Again, it uses the same sensors as your Multiray, so you'll have a commonality in your parts you're using. And then, You've got your uh, charging cradle that came with the instrument, and when you engage that in the cradle, you want to snap it in so it doesn't go anywhere, or you can just let it live on your Auto Ray 2 cradle and it will charge that way as well. So two different ways of charging your meters, and with the Toxi Ray Pro, you have a cradle. So it too will go through a warm-up sequence. It will also, at the end of that warm-up sequence, should ask you if you want to do a fresh air cow. And so if you want to go ahead and say yes to that at the end of the warm-up sequence, it just goes through, uh, I think it's only a 30-second countdown on a Toxiray Pro. And then at the end, it will say that you fresh air cowed, and now uh, you can run the three-step process, which is what again? What's the very first step? Fresh air cow, which it should ask you that at the end of the warm-up. The next step, we don't need to do the pump stall because there is no pump. And so then the last step would be your bump check. Again, bump checks are so important to make sure that sensor's responding to gas. So you'd pick up your, you guys have Toxiray Pros for hydrogen cyanide. You would grab your HCN cow gas and apply the gas to the sensor to watch the reading scroll up or use your Autoray 2 cradle to perform the bump check for you. 